refrain and abstain from food and drink, then it inculcates a sort of transparent clarity so we can think properly. So I do want you guys, inshallah, to pay attention. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost that He allows us to take something back. And this is the guarantee that I give you. I guarantee you will 100% learn something new today and take something back which can hopefully change yourselves and hopefully change the community at large. So I just want a quick show of hands. Who enjoyed learning history at school? One person, one lesson. Not surprising for Mona Sam Michelle. Two people, maybe. So I, I, I pretty much expected that. And I would have put my hand up as well. Because when you learn history at school, I, I'll give you an example of what it's like. You're just expected to be a computer. Just facts and figures and statistics are thrown at you. You're expected to process them and then compute them. And then when it comes to the exam time, just thrust them out as if you're some processing unit. And then after the exam's finished, you can just flush your brain of all that information. I don't think anybody would remember anything. World War II, World War I, the Cold War. It just all gets drained out of our head. There's a reason for that. There's a reason. Because we have no affinity with history. We think to ourselves, World War I, what do I have to do with that? World War II, what difference does it make to me? The Boer Wars and Cold War. I mean, I was born after that and I live in a completely separate continent. How does that even affect me? There's zero moral value. You don't feel like you're taking something back and it's enriching and enhancing your life. This is where we get to the historical philosophy of Islam, Islamic history, right? And there are two, one verse and then one narration from a companion which pretty much encapsulate why we study history and why history is important to us. And this is going to be a shocking fact, right? One third of the Quran is composed of historical narratives. Imagine that, the Quran you pick up every single day, one third of it is dedicated to historical accounts of the past. I mean, Adam alayhi salam's story, isn't that history? What about Nuh alayhi salam, Lut alayhi salam? Even the Prophet ﷺ, for us now that's history. So, Allah says in the Quran, وَكُلَّنْ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فؤادك. Allah says we recount all sorts of different assorted stories of the people from the past and the Prophets, not for entertainment, not to lull you to sleep as a lullaby, not so that you can maybe turn on the TV, watch a bit of amusement and then you turn it off. People know what show I'm talking about. But Allah says, "Man to bihi for adak." You should be studying history so that it can strengthen and reinforce your heart. It should ultimately draw you closer to Allah and bring you one step closer to paradise. Wa kulla naqusu alayka min anba al-rusul, man uthabbi to bihi for adak, wa jaaka fi hadhi al-haq, wa ma'ida wa dhikr al-mu'minin. In it, in these stories, are the truth, which is very important because when we talk about history, we have to be factually accurate. Whatever we say has to be backed up by solid proof and evidence. Number two, وَذِكْرَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Guidance for mankind and a reminder. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he used to say, السعيد من اتعظ بغيره A truly fortunate person isn't somebody who has wealth or somebody who has so many properties or maybe so many different diverse investments on their portfolio. It's somebody who من اتعظ بغيره Somebody who can take a lesson from somebody else's misfortune or somebody else's fortune. That's what you call a genuinely lucky person. So that's why we study history. Because what we want to do is, especially to our younger generations, because I feel like history is a criminally neglected discipline. Nobody knows anything about it. And that's important because if you don't know your past, you don't know where you stand today. And if you don't know where you stand today, how can you build your future tomorrow? That's why it's important because history, according to a very erudite scholar called Ibn Khaldun he's dubbed as the father of sociology if you go to any western university you want to study economics or history philosophy then Ibn Khaldun's reading will be mandatory on your reading list and he was a Muslim scholar so he developed a subject called sociology which a French sociologist claimed to have invented in the 18th century but he, he preceded them by nearly five centuries he said history is cyclical in nature history goes around it's like revolving doors Something happens and then a few generations down the line, the same thing repeats again. So if we're negligent of our history, we're bound to repeat it. And that's what we see today. So by studying the lives of the people from the past, very importantly, number one, it reminds us not of our victories, but first and foremost of our defeats. That's very important. Look at the stories of Lut alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, Hud alayhi salam, Salih alayhi salam. They don't all have 
a Disney-esque, picturesque ending, do they? I mean, Nuh alayhi salam, all of the people of his locality were wiped out. I wouldn't really call that a happy ending. Lut alayhi salam, only him and a handful of believers survived. That's not a happy ending. There's only once, there are only three stories in the Quran, it's an interesting fact, which are mentioned only once. Allah only talks about them once. Other stories Allah repeats them time and time again. Adam alayhi salam, he was in paradise and then banished. One day he was there, the next day he wasn't. That's a tragic story. In the end, in the end, believers will always prevail in paradise. But in this world, in this world, you're going to have to learn to bear the vicissitudes and the ups and downs and highs and lows of life. That's what Allah tells us about Lut and Nuh and Hud and Salih alayhim salam. They were prophets, but they didn't have it easy. What did the Prophet say? Ashaddu nasi bala and al anbiya The people who have to face the most difficulty and peril in the face of faith are the prophets and then the people who then want to imitate them and follow them and I'm sure nobody here doesn't want to imitate the prophet so that means you have to gear yourself and prepare yourself to face difficulty so there are three stories in the Quran which are only mentioned once there's a reason for that Yusuf السلام, the story of Zul Qarnayn who most commentators say his stories would say is Cyrus the Great and then lastly the story of the sleepers of the cave and there's a reason for that because each and every single one of these stories portrays what we call a success archetype which is an example of somebody who went from strength to strength a happy ending happily ever after but the reason why Allah mentions these three stories only once is to show us that happily ever after in this world is just the exception and the norm is you will have to face troubles just like all the other prophets I mean Zakariya his story is not in the Quran but it's mentioned by different authorities Zakariya his entire locality antagonized against him. So he had an army chasing after him, just him by himself and an army pursuing him. So miraculously a tree opened up. So he thought, it's refuge for me. So he sought shelter in the tree, the tree closed up. And unfortunately, again, it's part of Allah's divine plan and wisdom. A little bit of his garment was hanging out of the door, not the door, sorry, the, uh, the tree. So it opened up like a door, it was hanging out of the tree. And the army made its way by, the commander was looking around, he was here a moment ago, now he's disappeared, he kind of just vanished into thin air. And then he saw a clue, he saw his garment just hanging out of the tree. So he ordered one of his swordsmen to slice the tree down from the middle with Zakaria alayhi salam sitting inside. And that's a prophet, that's a prophet. So these success archetypes are very rare. So in our life, and I've, and I've noticed this, especially after the earthquakes in Syria, we suffer from something called the optimism bias which is where we think we live in a sense of security we have a false sense of security so let me give you a litmus test and see if we suffer from the optimism bias when the earthquakes happened in Syria and in Turkey did you feel anything? did you feel like this could happen to me tomorrow? did you feel like I could lose my entire family tonight? did you feel like I could wake up and then the front face of my house just isn't there anymore? Or did you go to sleep safe and sound thinking, I live in England. We don't live on any major fault lines like they do in Turkey and Syria. My parents are still here. I'm going to wake up tomorrow, go to work, 9 to 5 job. All dandy and rosy and red, nothing, no, no problems there, everything fine. And I guarantee you most of us will have. Because I know, saying this with embarrassment, I, I felt like that. I felt apathetic, indifferent. I didn't feel like there was anything different that's going to happen to me tomorrow. That's what you call the optimism bias false sense of security. When you study history, you realize anything could happen to anyone at any moment in time. So you have to remind yourself, you know what, I could go to, I could be in the graveyard tomorrow, I could be in my casket and my coffin, my family could be burying me tomorrow. So I need to really buckle myself up and start packing for the hereafter. Right, so that's first and foremost, it reminds us of our defeat. I know time is always against us, but I'm going to try and distill as much here. So it reminds us how we've strayed from the paths of progress and piety and prosperity and this is why some people I feel like don't want to study history because I feel it's, it's, it's uncomfortable I feel as if they're not going to get a magical Disney story where everything starts off well a bit of a dip and then there's a happily ever after happy ending in the end people want these types of fantastical romanticized stories which you won't get if you open up the Quran which you won't get in our Islamic history they want all these enchanting fairy tales but history is sobering. History is liberating because it opens up your eyes to the reality of the world you're living in. That's why it's very important. For us, we should approach history as a time capsule. It contains the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what I want to stress from now is, if you ever open up a book of Islamic history, don't expect to find uh, a whole roster of Khalid ibn al-Walids or a whole roster of Umar radiallahu anhu. 
you're going to find a bit of everyone. You might find the Abu Jahls and you'll find the Umar radiallahu an. You might find some people in between. And it's very childish for you to approach history with this dichotomy of I just want to find the good people and the evil people. As if it's a superhero movie, you'll find the superheroes, you'll find the villains and that's it. It's all one big grey area. You might find good people who've done bad things. Then you find bad people who've done good things. Then you find terrible people who did amazing things. So you'll find a whole spectrum of individuals. What that helps you to do is keeps you grounded in reality. So you don't make judgment calls about anybody you live with. So you might see somebody who is an amazing person. You keep yourself grounded. He's amazing, but I mean, you keep a, a dose of healthy skepticism. And then you see somebody who's on the streets and he looks like he's an absolute hopeless cause and he's a lost cause. But you've read about somebody in history, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf maybe, we'll get to him today. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, one of the most oppressive, tyrannical individuals and governors to ever grace the books of our history. But he did amazing things. You open up a Quran today and you'll notice on your bar you'll have a, dot, a diacritic mark underneath. And a ta, two dots on top, a tha, three dots on top, a jim, one dot in the middle, ha, one dot on top. Now wouldn't you be surprised if I was to tell you, there was a time when you had none of these dots in the Quran. Thinking, how on earth am I going to read that? Alhamdulillah, and then you get stuck at Rabb. Because what is it? Is it a ba, or is it a ta, or is it a tha? These diacritical points, these dots, were non-existent before. But along came Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. He saw that the borders of the Islamic State are expanding. More people are entering into the fold of Islam, non-Arabs. Non now we need to facilitate their recitation of the Quran. So let's add these dots. But then what if I was to tell you he also killed companions? And he also mercilessly and brutally executed yeah. Muslims for petty reasons. Right? So now how do we judge somebody like that? Well, we don't judge them. We, we relinquish their legacy to the pages of history. We just take a lesson from them. Judging isn't our prerogative. We're not judge, jury, and execution. And that's for Allah to decide. We read the good, the bad, and the ugly, ugly, and take a lesson from it. I've just gone to the introduction, but hopefully we can skip through. What I do want to say here is, I wanted to highlight one personality from Muslim history. And I know for a fact, he's going to be a fan favorite for our Tablighi brothers. I'll get to that in a moment. I'll get to why. But he comes from, well, he doesn't come from the subcontinent, but he, he's, he's left an indelible impact on the people of the subcontinent, so really us. So if it weren't for him, I, I don't think it'd be an overstatement to say if it weren't for him, then we wouldn't be here today. That's quite a bold claim to make, and I'll explain later on why. But the thing is, when it comes to subcontinent history, this is lamentable, where most historians, expert historians today, who write about Muslim history, are not even Muslim. How does that even make sense? History should be written by Muslims for Muslims. But today it seems to be written by academics for then a very select group of academics. So how does that benefit us? The fact that Allah has put historical accounts in the Quran shows there's benefit in it for us. He validates historical narratives. So with the people of the subcontinent, unfortunately what's happened is because of Hindutva and the rise of the uh, Indian far right, their legacies have been tarnished. These people have been portrayed as absolutely vile, despicable monsters. The person we're going to talk about today, Mahmoud Ghaznavi is one of them, and Sultan Aurangzeb Alamgir is one of them as well. I mean, you have dedicated channels on Twitter and Facebook, created and generated just to create false accounts, just to falsify and doctor and distort history. Why, why is that? So that they can then otherize they can then stigmatize every single Muslim living in India. That's what they're doing right now. To show that, well, hang on a second, you're a Muslim? Well, Aurangzeb Alambir was also a Muslim. So that means you must subscribe to the same tyrannical tactics as him. So that means that we have to crack down on you as well. That's how they legitimize otherizing and oppressing Muslims in India. By saying your Muslim forebears were actually invaders here. You don't belong here. That's what they say. Mahmoud Ghaznavi, Sultan um, Aurangzeb Alamgir, they were just foreigners. They were Muslims, but they were foreigners. They've got no Indianness in their blood. So the same for you. Imagine telling that to 200 million people. 200 million of your own populace. So we need to reclaim history. Because, and I, and I read this amazing quote, which is, as long as the lion doesn't learn to speak, only the tales of the hunter will be told. I'm going to say that again. You can put it on your status if you want. As long as the lion doesn't learn to tell its own story, only the tales of the hunter will be told. Put it in simple words, history is written by the victim, right? So unfortunately, we see Muslims on the back foot, wherever they are in the world, politically, financially, economically, definitely militarily, right? But religiously, we always have that strength. And we have to tap into our religious strength to then 
create times of prosperity around us. And that's what I want to talk about today. One individual. There's a lot I could say, but I'm just going to skim over it right now. So, our Tablighi brothers. Right? So if you sit in Gash Adabs, then cliche often told story is the story of Taif. And the reason why I call it cliche is because it has much didactic utility, which, 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 which means that this story can change people's lives. The story of Taif can revolutionize a person's heart and can transform them from uh, a non-practicing Muslim into a friend of Allah in an instant. That's how much power and impact this one story has. But I think because we've told it so many times and we're not refreshing it with new perspectives, then maybe it, its impact and value has become lost on us. So the story is very simple. The Prophet went to the people of Ta'if, he wanted to bring them to Islam. The three chieftains said no, so then he, he, the Prophet was chased out by the street urchins, they pelted him, he was drenched in blood, his sandals were clogged to his feet. And then Jibreel Islam, the archangel, came to him and said, look, I've got the angel who's deputized to uh, supervise these two mountains. And Ta'if is in the middle of a mountain pass. If you ever meet a Ta'if today, you have, to tra- you have to traverse a huge mountain to get to the city itself, which is wedged in between two mountains. So this angel, he can crush the people of Ta'if in one fell swoop. So what did the Prophet say? I'm, I'm going to ask a question here. What did the Prophet say after? Just, you don't have to repeat it, just paraphrase. Leave the people of Ta'if because somebody from their progeny will accept Islam and then be a flag bearer for the religion of Islam. Right? And then the story ends there. We don't ask anybody what happens after that. Well, who is he? We've been left on a cliffhanger here, but I guess we need to build our intellectual appetite. So today, that's what I want to tell you about. His name, just etch his name into your minds because without him, like I said, we wouldn't be here today. His name is Muhammad ibn al-Qasim. His name is Muhammad ibn al-Qasim. And he came from the tribe of Thaqif and the people of Thaqif were natives of Ta'if. And Ta'if, they had a really special relationship with the people of Mecca. So Mecca during the Prophet's time was an economic hub and powerhouse. <coughs> they used to go for their trading missions to the south in Yemen and then to the north in Syria. So they were a major stopover for these really rich caravans. So they were at the top of society in Arabia. So their holiday destination was actually Ta'if. I don't know, maybe today you say it's Dubai. So for them it was Ta'if. During the uh, winter months in Mecca, they would moved to their retreats in Ta'if. But they used to see themselves, the people of Mecca, the Quraysh, and then the people of Thaqif, as Ta'if, they used to see themselves as superior, above and beyond everybody else, the cream of the crop. So they used to look down on the rest. So he came from this tribe, the tribe of Thaqif. Just to interject here. The story of the people of Thaqif's acceptance of Islam, the main leading chieftains, is comical, it's laughable. So the Prophet ﷺ, in the eighth year of migration, he'd come back to Mecca, he'd liberated Mecca from the polytheists, and now he's making his way to Ta'if because the tribes of Hawazin and Thaqif are now arming and mobilizing themselves. The tribe of Hawazin were expert archers and bowmen. So the Prophet made his way there, the Battle of Hunayn took place and ensued, the Prophet won, then the people of Ta'if retreated into their forts at Hunayn and the Prophet besieged the forts and when it comes to siege warfare it's a battle, it's a case of what we call attrition which is who can last the longest it's not about who can defeat the others it's about who can last the longest it's a game of stamina the people inside, do they have enough supplies to last the people outside do they have enough stamina and encouragement to continue bombarding and besieging the uh, beleaguered inhabitants for months and months this time the Prophet's men, they suffered from fatigue. So they pulled back and they said, you know what, we'll just leave it be for now. And then this is how Allah's miraculous nature works. So some people from Thaqif actually came to the Prophet saying we want to accept Islam. The Prophet said, it's a welcome surprise. So they went back to Medina. The people of Thaqif came back to Medina as well. And the Prophet lodged them at the back of the mosque. Actually, the Prophet set these non-Muslims up in the back of the mosque so they could observe proceedings. So maybe that, so the Prophet didn't talk to them for a few days. He just wanted them to observe how Muslims live and how Muslims interact with one another. And that usually, most of the time, that was an incentive for them to accept Islam. So people of Ta'if were quite stubborn. So they came to the Prophet, we want to accept now. But, but, we've got a few caveats, we've got a few conditions you have to meet. The Prophet said, that's fine, whatever you want to say, we can agree to that. Look how ludicrous these were. So they said, first of all, we're not going to pay zakah. The Prophet said, okay, we'll, we'll deal with that. What's your second request? We're not going to pay salah. Okay, right, fair enough, we'll leave that be. The third one, we want to carry on worshipping our idol. And then we'll become a Muslim. The Prophet said, you can't be a Muslim if you don't pay zakah, if you don't read your salah, if you don't relinquish idol worship. 
uh, back and forth, back and forth. And then the Prophet said, you know what? Okay, zakah, salah, just start with two a day. It's a good point here for converts. For converts, it's difficult to have them accept everything all in one day. I mean, the Quran was revealed over 23 years. The Sahaba couldn't process everything all in one day. So everything has to be given in piecemeal. So take it easy on the convert brothers. Make sure you hold their hands and walk them through the steps. Because it's a difficult process. Your whole world has changed around you. Anyway, so Prophet said, Salah, just read two a day. Zakah, it's fine. We'll talk about it later on. But you, you just got to get rid of your idol. That's just non-negotiable. So they said, right, fair enough. But we still have a connection with our idols. So can you send somebody from your companions who can destroy the idol for us? Prophet said, okay, that's fine if that's what you want. So we sent two companions. One quite hot-headed, feisty one. So they got there. And then this companion could still tell that they, they still held, they still retained some sort of affinity with the idol. So he thought, let's play a practical joke on them. He went up to the idol. He was just about to strike it with his axe and then he feigned a seizure. He pretended to be suffering from a spasm and he fell to the ground and convulsing and all sorts. So the people of Ta'if immediately, oh see, I told you so. I told you, see, our idols still have the power to harm anybody who tries to violate their sanctity. So the companion got up and he laughed in their face and he said, I knew you guys still had some uh, disbelief inside of you. And then at that moment, he chopped the idol down. Right? So these are people of Thaqif. But see how Allah changed the people. We've got now Muhammad ibn Qasim. His father passed away when he was young. He was raised as an orphan. And his mother, may Allah bless her, may Allah grant her reward, because she raised, and this is another point here. Mothers are, I think I read a quote somewhere saying that, Mothers are the ones who actually bring about men for the next generation. Mothers are the ones who behind the scenes were doing all the work to create men who will lead the Muslims and men to lead the community in the future. Right? But they don't get enough credit. They're the unsung heroes. Right? So his mother, sent, uh, his mother sent him to learn Islamic knowledge. And from a young age, he showed a, uh, a sharp aptitude for military tactics and strategies. So he carried on and he grew up. So now, let's just put that on pause. Let's just set the scene now. So, does anybody know in which year, talking about the CE year, the Prophet ﷺ passed away? Does anybody know? I'll give you a hint, it was 6 something. 632. 632 CE. Right? The Prophet passed away 632. Let's give a quick time there. And Abu Bakr took charge. He was in charge for two years. 634. 634 to 644, Umar radiallahu he took the reins. And he kept control for 10 years. 644 to 656, Uthman radiallahu So he had the longest reign out of the rightly guided caliphs for, for 12 years. Then Ali radiallahu anhu for 6 years. Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhu, all of them unfortunately were assassinated. All of them. Umar radiallahu anhu actually standing on the Imam's position, leading Fajr Salah. Uthman radiallahu anhu besieged in his own house in Medina. And Ali radiallahu anhu, he was making his way to the Grand Mosque of Kufa to lead Salah. So they were all assassinated. Then Hassan radiallahu anh, takes charge for six months. Little known fact, he is the fifth of the five rightly guided caves. Hassan radiallahu anh, the Prophet's grandson. So the Prophet actually prophesied. The Prophet was sat on the pulpit here, and Hassan radiallahu anh, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anh, they used to mess around in the mosque. They used to mess around. The Prophet was delivering a sermon, he would climb on top of the pulpit, think the Prophet's a climbing frame, and start clambering over him when he was in salah as well. So the Prophet pointed to him midway through a sermon and said, Inna bni hadha sayyid. This grandson of mine is a true natural born leader. The Prophet said, I hope, perhaps, this is the Prophet's wording for a prophecy, that maybe in the future, sometime in the future, Allah will allow my grandson here to bring reconciliation and bring together, bring the hearts, unify the hearts of two warring, great warring Muslim armies. And it just so happened. Ali Hassan radiallahu anh, during Ali radiallahu anh's time, there was a period which was known as the civil war between Ali radiallahu anh and Muawiyah radiallahu anh. Both of them will go to paradise, both of them have been guaranteed salvation in the hereafter. It was not a chance for us to then give our say and judgment. Like we said, why not judge, jury and execution. If Allah has already said about these companions, radiallahu anhum wa radu anh, that Allah is properly pleased with them and well satisfied with them, and who are we to then interject and interfere and meddle? Right, so these people are our exemplars and paragons. We look up to them because if it weren't for them, how would we have the religion that we have today? So there was a misunderstanding between the two. So Ali, Ali, Ali passed away, he passed the baton on to Hassan. Hassan said, look, Muawiyah is the best person for the job. 
for the Caliphate. So he willingly seceded and abdicated and he passed over the Caliphate to Muawiyah This was in the year 661. Right, so keep that date in mind. 661, this is when we have an era inaugurated known as the Imperial Caliphate. Where the Umayyads now take charge. Anybody here heard of the Umayyads before? Okay, right, so I guess this is important. The Umayyads, right? Out of all the Muslim empires, Umayyads, Abbasids, the Ottomans, the Seljuks, the Ayyubids, whatever. Out of all of them, the one dynasty which had the largest landmass in kilometers squared per million were the Umayyads, and they were the first. They ruled for nearly 90 years, from 661 to 750. Under their rule, 12 million kilometers squared was under their control. That was their territorial gain. In the west, from Spain, Muslim Spain, all the way up until Tibet and Turkestan in the east, all of that was under Muslim rule. Right? Can you can just imagine the huge landmass under one unified Muslim rule with a caliph? They were untouchable. The Byzantines would tremble in their boots just at the mention of Muawiyah's name. A popular holiday destination today, <coughs> Cyprus, and an adjoining uh, island, Crete, both of them actually conquered by Muawiyah during the caliphate of Uthman. And the Prophet said, he was talking to one of his relatives called Umm Haram, Bintu <coughs> Milham. He, he was in a house and, she was, and the Prophet must have had a vision and he said, a time will come and give glad tidings to those of my companions who ride the waves in search of Allah's pleasure and in the path of Allah. So she said, That's, that, that sounds quite enigmatic, what are you talking about? So the Prophet clarified that a group of my people will face martyrdom in the path of Allah, riding the waves. So she said, will I be a part of them? And the Prophet said, yes, you will. He confirmed that. So during the era of Uthman, عن, he was the first one to actually establish a fully formed professional Muslim navy. And the first admiral was Muawiyah. And the Prophet said, anybody who takes part in the first ever Muslim naval expedition will be guaranteed paradise. Muawiyah wasn't just involved, he supervised it, he spearheaded it. He asked Umar عن, in his reign, please just give me permission, can I go and take over and invade Cyprus. Umar said, look, we've never launched a naval expedition before. I'm a bit scared that people might not be up for the task. So Muawiyah said, that's fair enough, that's fine, we'll put it on hold. Uthman's caliphate came around. Uthman radiallahu and Muawiyah, they were cousins from the Umayyad, Umayyad clan. The Umayyads come from a person called Umayyah. And he was the brother of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's great grandfather. So they're closely related, these two tribes. The Prophet's tribe and the Umayyads. So Uthman said, yeah, you've got to go ahead. Just don't force anybody into it. Anybody who willingly, then, uh, anybody who willingly puts themselves forward to be recruited for the task, then you take them on. Muawiyah went, conquered Cyprus, and it was under his control. So anyway, going back to Muhammad ibn al-Qasim. Right, so he lived in a time known as the High Caliphate, where the Caliph was untouchable, where Muslims were feared around the world. And I'll give you one reason why. Right, we're not going to talk about economical or logistical or financial, just one reason. Which is the centrality of the Qur'an. That's it. If there's anything you want to take from Muslim history, it's the centrality of the Qur'an. You have Muslims who came from Spain, they were known as the Moors. You had Muslims who came from North Africa, they were the local people known as the Berbers. There were people who came from the Persian lands, the Persians, the Arabs, the Indians, the Mongols. The Africans, the Europeans, the Ottomans held the Balkans for nearly 250 years. Right? Europeans, white, uh, blue-eyed, blonde-haired Europeans were Muslims. In Bosnia, Albania, Greece, yeah, Romania, Bulgaria, all of these countries, current-day countries, were under Ottoman rule for so many years. All of these people from disparate backgrounds and different ethnicities, but there was one thing. There was one thing which united them, and that was the Qur'an. That was the centrality of the Qur'an to their life and to their worldview. Your worldview, your lens has to be dominated by the Qur'an. If it's not, then how can you be a true believer? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu tkhulu fi silmi kafa. All you who believe, enter into Islam. Not half-heartedly with one foot in and one foot out. Kafa. Completely. Submit yourself to Allah. You're a Muslim. Somebody asks you, what does that mean you're a Muslim? If a non-Muslim asks you. Well, Muslim in Arabic means somebody who submits and surrenders. Well, who do you surrender to? I surrender to God. Well, okay, as a Christian, I surrender to the Lord Jesus himself. Or as a Jew, I, I surrender to my God. 
as uh, a Hindu, I surrender to my many gods as well. So, you know, I surrender to a god, you surrender to a god. No, no. I surrender to my god, Allah who revealed the Quran. I surrender to my god through the Quran. And if I don't submit myself to the Quran, I'm deficient in my submission to Allah. This, there's, there's a golden chain of events. And I'm not going to take credit for this because he's genius, but it came from a historian in London called Ustad Adnan Rashid. So he said, it's a golden chain of events. Uh, people look at the Muslim world today and think, what on earth happened to us? Uh, we used to rule the world. We were the most feared people on the face of this earth. There's a reason why the Western civilization has skyrocketed and surpassed everybody else. You'll find this laughable. Shall I tell you why? One of the reasons, because of the Ottomans. They were so scared that the Ottomans would encroach on their territory in Western Europe that they multiplied and doubled their efforts in engineering and developing revolutionary weaponry so they could use against who the Ottomans. And then they had all this engineering and industry and economy which led them to where they are today. It was because of the Ottomans. They were scared. There's a phrase, there's a phrase in Western popular history known as at the gates of Vienna. That's because the Ottoman Sultan slash Caliph, Suleiman al Qanuni, in the West, they gave him the title. Not Ottomans. The West gave him the title of the Magnificent. They were enthralled and captivated by him. Imagine that. Imagine a person from the West and Europe, a white person, blue eyes, blonde hair, being absolutely captivated by a Muslim. Today it's unthinkable. We're looked down upon. We're a, drown we're a downtrodden people. Nobody wants to bat an eye towards us Muslims. Look everywhere in the world, Muslims are being oppressed. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because we've forgotten our links with the Quran. So, at the gates of Vienna, he took his Ottoman army, his crack specialist, excellent Ottoman army, and besieged the city of Vienna. It was a failed abortive siege nonetheless. In the year, it was around 1529 it was. But that really was a wake-up call and a shock to the Europeans. Oh my gosh, how on earth have the Ottomans reached Vienna? Vienna was the capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Just put it into perspective. Imagine an army from Saudi Arabia making its way to London and besieging the city of London. It, it, it held that status for the Europeans. And since that moment, they doubled their efforts. We need to shore up our defences and develop our armies and military strategies. Right? So, he says it's a golden chain of events, which all starts with the Qur'an. The Qur'an brings its own brand of justice. Right? People today are always talking about political correctness and justice and equality in society with all of these isms pervasive everywhere. The only brand and franchise of justice we need is in this book here, on these shelves around you, which we just uh, we pick up, we don't even know what it's saying, speaking to us. You know what it's saying, just read it, maybe put on a nice tune and then uh, just stack it back on the shelf. And when Ramadan's finished, it doesn't even exist. Just collecting dust. Or if you're lucky, you might have it as a house ornament or decoration in your house. So if a guest comes, wow, that's a really nice gilded version of the Quran you've got there. Or that's a really nice casing you've got there. That book, that book is the key to our success. History proves that. The Quran brought its own brand of justice. And the people of old, they might have been deficient maybe in and of themselves as human beings when it came to acting upon the Qur'an. When it came to the worldview dominated by Islam, the Qur'an has to be at the forefront. So what happens when justice comes along? When you have justice, you have peace. People can relax, people can unwind, people can focus on the real issues we face in society. We can't focus on the proper issues that Muslims should be facing like developing ourselves because today we're always on the we're always on the defensive, we're always on the back front, on the, on, the, on the back foot, sorry. We always have to defend our religion. Somebody criticizes the Hanafi law, law school, we have to defend it. Somebody criticizes our religion, we have to defend it. Somebody criticizes our prophet, we have to defend it. Where's the peace there? How do we have any intellectual peace to focus on science, to focus on the humanities, to focus on technology? The Muslims of old invented all of this during the so-called Islamic golden age. I mean, you had Muslims writing books about optics and Muslims writing books about philosophy. Muslims, Muslims writing books about surgical operations that were used in the West for centuries. And these people actually, just on a bit of a side note here, just on a bit of a side note, when these people studied the religion, it automatically took them to science. When these people, the early Muslims, studied the Quran, it took them to science. When astronomers would write their treatises 
on astronomy, you know what they start off with? They wouldn't start off with uh, dedication to such and such a professor <coughs> or I'm making uh, a commendation for X, Y, and Z lecturer. They would say, I read a verse in the Quran which says Allah created the universe and Allah created the cosmos and Allah created all of these celestial beings. I want to know more about my creator, so I'm going to learn about this. Ibn Rushd wrote a book called uh, Al Qanun al Tibbi, I think it was called, the canon of, uh, of, medis of, of medicinal sciences. So at the start, you know what he said? He said, when I study anatomy, when I study the human body, I feel as if it's a stepping stone for me to learn more about my creator. If I learn about the creation and how wonderful and magnificent this human body is, you can't even replicate one organ or one limb from a human body. You can have prosthetic limbs, but it's not the same. You can have a pig's heart, but it's not the same. When I study the creation, it automatically leads me directly to the creator. That's how they approach history. That's how they approach biology and chemistry and physics. When have we ever sat down with our kids after school and told them, you know, what did you learn about um, in physics or in chemistry and whatever? Oh, I learned about the uh, stars and I learned about gravity and I learned about the sun. But why don't you tell them, you know what, if the sun, scientifically speaking, if the sun was a few millimeters back and if the sun was a few millimeters further away from the earth, the earth would freeze over. And if the sun was a few millimeters closer to the earth, the earth would become scorched. We won't be able to live and survive. You tell me, who on earth, who in the entire universe can operate with such surgical precision except for Allah? This should bring us closer. So anyway, justice from the Qur'an brings peace. Peace brings about prosperity. Now you can focus on developing your society. Now you can focus on industry. Now you can focus on infrastructure. And with prosperity, with prosperity comes the golden age. But where does it all start from? I want to ask you guys, where does it all start from? The Qur'an. It all started from the Qur'an. So if you want to look for success, then I'm sorry, you're looking for it in the wrong place if you don't go straight to that book. If you don't ask your Imam, you know what Imam, you've got your Mulana here. You've got how many scholars you have in deep though. Why don't you ask them, look, I read Surah Yasin every single morning. I want to know what it means. Can you maybe deliver a lecture? Maybe once every week. He will happily and gladly. These scholars are just itching for an opportunity. These scholars are itching for an opportunity to disseminate knowledge. They're like treasure trolls of knowledge. But I'm talking about myself first and foremost. We don't have the intellectual appetite. We don't want to ask them. Because we don't want to learn. So this golden chain of events is very, very important. This golden chain of events, starting with the Quran, explains the phenomenon of why Muslims were in charge of Spain. The Iberian Peninsula, as it was called. Spain and Egypt and parts of southern France. For 800 years. So Muslims are as much a part of Europe as the Europeans are themselves. But they don't want to tell you that. That's a very important piece of information which is deliberately and systematically hidden and expunged from textbooks. Because imagine telling your children that Muslims were in Spain for 800 years. You go to Spain now, you can still see the monuments and the relics. You go to Spain now, some words in Spanish are actually loan words from Arabic. But where are those people today? Where did 800 years of Muslim civilization in Spain go? You visit the Grand Mosque of Cordoba. Al Jami' al Qurtuba. Cordoba was the capital of the Umayyad Caliphate in Spain. And this is mind boggling. At a time, we're talking about maybe the 1000s, 1100s. At a time in Europe when they were stooped and they had sunken so deep down into darkness and superstition, where if you wanted to offload your household waste, then just collect it in a bucket and just toss it out the window onto the street. You'd have running streams of garbage in Europe. Everybody, most people were illiterate. During that time of feudalism and serfdom, you would practically be a slave to your master. Whoever owns the land, he owns you basically. And 80% of your income as a serf, as a peasant in Europe, would go to feudal dues and taxes. Imagine that, we complain about our taxes today, imagine 80%, I mean these people would have received pennies first of all, then 80% going to a higher authority, how could that be called living? But look at the parallel situation in Cordoba. A nun from England, she hadn't even set foot in Cordoba, and she said, Cordoba, from what I've heard from the travellers coming to and fro, is the ornament of the world, is the centre of the world. They had, if I can remember, they had around four main royal libraries 
and each library housed 500,000 manuscripts. Compare that, compare that with the largest library in Europe, which was in Switzerland, in a Christian monastery called St. Gaul's Monastery. You know how many manuscripts they had? Four. They had four manuscripts in one library. This is meant to be the largest library. And it called over 500,000 to each. They were people of intellect. They were people of learning. We are, as Muslims, across our history, the most bookish people you'll ever find. We were involved in learning and reading and writing and articulation and poetry and everything. Why? Because the Quran brought peace, which brought prosperity, which brought then a uh, prospering civilization, which we also dearly want today. Right? That's, that's, what, that's what we want. We just want to live in this world with a little bit of self-governance and with determination to know that we actually provide and contribute something to society. Where does it start from? It starts from the Quran. Anyway, to backtrack, Muhammad ibn al-Qasim. So Muhammad ibn al-Qasim, he was actually the nephew of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was a strong man and enforcer for the Umayyads. Like I said, he's a bit of a Marmite figure. So, I mean, he has some good points to his name and he has some demerits to his name as well. But again, it's not our job to judge. So, Muhammad ibn al-Qasim was the leader and supervisor of an army which was dispatched from Damascus, the caliphal capital of the Umayyads, to, can anybody guess where? Just throw some, just throw some geographical locations at me. China. Oh, close, close to China. Close to China, just south of China. China, Tibet, or Turkestan as it was historically known as, was actually conquered around the same time, the year 711, by somebody called Qutayba ibn Muslim. So simultaneously, I mean, you had Tariq ibn Ziyad in Spain, who was conquering the lands of the Iberian Peninsula, Andalusia. Simultaneously, Qutayba ibn Muslim in Turkestan, Tibet, bordering China. And at the same time, Muhammad ibn Qasim in Sindh. In Sindh, in modern day Pakistan. Just brief pause. Tariq ibn Ziyad. His name might sound familiar. If you've heard of Gibraltar, then you've heard of Tariq ibn Ziyad. So when Tariq ibn Ziyad was making his journey across the Mediterranean to invade the uh, Spanish mainland, which is under Visigoth control, then he stopped at a monolithic rock, a small little island, which he made his staging ground for the uh, impending attack. And people dubbed that as Jabal al-Tariq. Can you hear the, the, uh, the uh, phonetical similarity there? Jabal al-Tariq, the mountain of Tariq, and it was distorted over so many centuries to now become Gibraltar. Right, so Gibraltar, Jabal al-Tariq. I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a Muslim. So Muhammad ibn al-Qasim. So he is the one who brought Islam into Sindh, and Sindh is the gateway There's something known as the, uh, the Khyber Pass Which is close to Afghanistan That was seen as the gateway into India If you control those lands Then you can start making headway into India So Muhammad ibn Qasim was called by his uncle Hajjaj ibn Yusuf It's the backstory behind this So something happened The king and the monarch of Ceylon Which is Sri Lanka a Historical name for Sri Lanka He had good relations with Hajjaj ibn Yusuf The Umayyad governor so he sent a ship filled with uh, local Muslims who'd been uh, raised by Muslim traders and their, their uh, forefathers had passed away. So he was sending them back as a goodwill gesture. <coughs> Sri Lanka was historically known as, uh, for Muslims, he was known as Jaziratul Yaqut, the Sapphire Island, because it was rich in resources. So this leader from Ceylon, uh, from Sri Lanka, he sent a shipload. He had jewels and goods and riches and all types of uh, flashy items you could think of along with Muslims when it was close to Sri Lanka it was intercepted by pirates and corsairs from Sindh so one young girl aboard that ship who was kidnapped and uh, taken hostage she wrote a very heart-wrenching letter to Hajjaj ibn Yusuf and very famously she wrote at the end Ya Hajjaj Hajjaj come and save me so the letter passed hands and went from one person to another messenger to messenger envoy to envoy then reached Hajjaj in his, uh, in his regional capital in Basra, modern day uh, Iraq. When he read the letter, he was overcome with anger and rage and he said, Labbaik, I am at your service, so don't worry, I will liberate you. So he called for his nephew, Muhammad ibn Qasim. And he said, we've got a pressing matter to attend to here. Right? We've got Muslims kidnapped, Muslims taken hostage in Sri Lanka. That's not in Sri Lanka, sorry, in Sindh. So we need to rescue them, we need to send an expeditionary force. He'd, he had already sent two from beforehand, but the problem was, 
the fortresses in Sindh were too heavily fortified, they were impenetrable. And the local leader in Sindh called Raja Dahir, he actually employed elephant course. So he had tanks, but they were elephants. The Muslims had never seen them before. So imagine coming across an elephant in the battlefield, heavily armored to the teeth with its huge tusks bulging out. That is a petrifying sight. So the Muslims lost courage. They didn't know what to do in the face of the elephants, a whole battalion of elephants. So the two initial expeditionary forces Hajjaj had sent, they were cut down, mowed down, cut to pieces. So they came back. Before that, Hajjaj sent a letter to Raja Dahi saying, look, you have some Muslims in your possession. They have been kidnapped and usurped by pirates. Either you deal with the pirates yourself, or you force them to send our Muslims back. Raja Dahir was apathetic, he couldn't care less. So Hajjaj said, these are Muslims. Doesn't matter where they've come from, doesn't matter what their ethnicity is, they are Muslims. They are part of the Muslim nation. They believe in the Quran which binds every single one of us. And it's my duty and obligation as a Muslim to serve my fellow brethren in, in faith. So that's when he started mobilizing the army. He called Muhammad ibn Qasim. He said, look, go to Damascus and uh, you can be initiated by the Caliph Al-Walid ibn Abd al-Malik. He can give you all the supplies. He was given 2,000 heavy Syrian cavalrymen and cavaliers. Make your way there. Then when he went, went back to Basra, he was reinforced by 2,000 more. Then he went to Shiraz as his, tra as his uh, staging ground, his frontal command, which is in modern day Iran. So very close to Sindh. You can see they're edging closer to Sindh. Now he's got a force of about 6,000 soldiers and he starts to make his uh, approach into Sindh. Let's just put that on hold. You know how old Muhammad ibn Qasim was? The man was 17. Muhammad ibn Qasim was 17 years old. Anybody 17 here? I've got a brother here, 17 years old. I asked myself this question. Imagine your dad saying to you, uh, you know what, can you take this money to the bank? Put it in the bank. You start trembling. I've never been to a bank before. I don't know what to do with the bank. Oh, okay, do I, do I, I don't know, press, do I, do I show my card? Do I show your card? I, I know people who are teenagers and their parents still take them to the doctors. So the doctor asks him a question, what's your name? Yes, look, right, can I give him my name? Okay, yeah, write down your name. And the doctor asks, are you suffering from a cold? Uh, you have to look to your mum for validation. Am I suffering from a cold? Yeah, you are. Yeah, to tell the doctor. So what kind of maturity and responsibility is this? But this man was given supervision of an entire army. Of an entire army. Can we honestly say, as youngsters, I'm, I'm probably from those youngsters as well, could we be given a responsibility and duly render services? No chance. And now as parents, are we raising children that can take on the responsibility maturely and responsibly in this world? You have to ask yourself that question. It's a double-edged sword for the children here and for the adults. Bit of a detour. You have three different types of languages. You have Islamic languages, which is only one, which is Arabic. It's a divinely sanctioned language. Because the Prophet said in a hadith, it's not rigorously authenticated, but it's acceptable to use. The Prophet said, love the Arabs for three reasons. Number one, because I'm an Arab, obviously. Number two, because the Quran is in Arabic. And number three, the language of the people of paradise will be Arabic as well. So Arabic is the language of the Quran. It's the lingua franca of the Muslim community. You go anywhere and everywhere. Muslims will know how to learn, speak, read, write Arabic. So Arabic binds us all together. That's an Islamic language. One step down, you have something called an Islamicate language, which is a language which wasn't really divinely ordained by God or by the Prophet, but because it has had exposure and close proximity to Islam and the people of Islam for so many years, the language practically becomes Islamic. It's been infused with an Islamic spirit and it has an Islamic outlook incorporated into it. That's why in Arabic you say salah and you automatically know what it refers to. Ritualistic prayer based on the uh, celestial movements five times a day with certain expressions and phrases and a certain inviolability. You know what it means. You don't have to explain when you say salah. Even a child understands. Now, in Farsi, in Persian and in Urdu, if you say namaz, you don't have to explain. People know what it means. Why? Because languages, these Islamic languages like Turkish, Syri uh, Syri sorry, um, Persian, then you had um, the uh, Mongol Turkic language, and uh, Urdu as well. All of these languages are Islamic languages because they've lived in close proximity with Muslims. They've practically <coughs> breathed and lived and eaten and drank Islam with the Muslims. But when it comes to the third level, when it comes to just modern non-religious languages, let's say English for example, 
Salah, Arabic, you know what it means. <coughs> Islamic hate language, Urdu, let's say. Urdu actually comes from the word Urdu, which is Turkic for a military camp. So the Urdu we speak was actually brought into the Indian subcontinent by the Mughals. You know, uh, uh, Alamgir, Akbar, Jahangir, all of these great Mughal emperors, they brought it in. And in their camps, in their military camps, you had a, a, a wide <coughs> variety of different soldiers. You had infantrymen from the Central Asian steppes who spoke Turkic. You had infantrymen from the Persian lands who spoke Persian. You had Arabic infantrymen. You had then Indian soldiers. And they all combined and blended together in this melting pot of their camps. Camps known as Ordu in Turkic. And that gave way to the Urdu we speak every single day. So it's good to appreciate these things as well. So Urdu that we speak every single day comes from actually Turkic and then from the Mughals. So these are all Islamic hate languages. I say namaz to you, you understand what it means? I don't know how to explain. Now, if I say prayer in English, what on earth does that mean? This is a prayer. This is a prayer. This is a prayer. So many things are prayers. With English, English hasn't lived side by side with Muslims for so many centuries. English doesn't know what Islam is. English doesn't know what it means to be a Muslim. So now, so now, that's what I want to say. If we culturally sever ourselves from our subcontinent or Turkish or Arabic culture and heritage, we are unwittingly severing the connection between us and Urdu, or us and Arabic, or us and Turkish, or us and Gujarati. These languages have breathed Islam. When we sever ourselves from our Islamic hate language, unwittingly, we sever ourselves from Islam. English has nothing to do with Islam. French has nothing to do with Islam. When the French colonized North Africa, the first thing, one of the first educational reforms they made was to set up convents, Christian schools, teaching the Bible and teaching French. If you can break the connection between somebody and his culture, and somebody and his language, you have direct access to his heart, which is the vault of faith. And it's left unguarded now. That's why when people say, oh, I don't like my Gujarati culture, or my Pakistani culture, or my whatever culture. So what culture do you want to be associated with then? You can't be acultural. You can't ha not have a culture. Because if you're here in England, and you don't want to subscribe to your back home culture, then you're going to be affected by Western culture. Now, back home culture, you're going to have your superstitions, you're going to have your innovations, you're going to have things that need to be refined. But Islam is there. Islam, our ancestors, you've got people here, ask them, they didn't have lectures like this. They didn't have a uh, scholar coming from outside delivering seminars and webinars and all sorts every single week. They just breathed and lived Islam. Islam came into their lives through osmosis. It just diffused into them because it was part of their culture. For us now, we have a culture clash between the West and now our back home heritage. We really have to keep a firm grip onto our back home heritage because unbeknownst to us, that's our link to our religion. So, sorry, we've taken a bit of a detour. So going back to Muhammad ibn Qasim, that's what he now makes his forays into sin. The original point I wanted to make was, you look at the Islamic language, Arabic, and the Islamic hate languages, I will give anybody a million pounds if they can find me the word teenager. You won't find it. It was, you're a child, and then you transition to manhood. There's no such concept as a teenager. I read an article from an Irish activist, an Irish uh, economist, and he said, the whole demographic of teenagers from 13 to 19 is actually a social construct invented by marketing gurus. They want to sell products. They want to sell irresponsible products to reckless people. But if they sell irresponsible products that people are definitely going to waste and squander their money on, they can't sell it to adults because adults are meant to be adults. They're meant to be responsible. They're meant to be very frugal and economic with their money. You can't be wasting money on, uh, I don't know, things that are unnecessary. Unnecessary luxuries in life. So we can't sell our products to adults. But children, they don't have the understanding to appreciate our products. They don't have the monetary capacity. So we can't, can't sell it to them. So you know what? Light bulb moment. Let's create a whole demographic of people who have the uh, spending capacities of an adult, but we can engineer them to have the responsibility of a child, which is zero responsibility. And that's exactly what teenagers are. I was there one day. You just spend money randomly, you just go to the corner shop, buy five pounds worth of sweets, not realizing that 
buying five pounds worth of sweets every other day, how much is that going to amount to at the end of the week? I remember people, they used to just buy takeaway every single day. Where did you get the money from? Oh, my dad gave it to me. No responsibility. But then they have the capacity to trade and to transact and to buy and to purchase. So this is a construct by marketing gurus. Why? Not because they want us to value their products. They want us to utilize their products because they want money. That's all it is. So Muhammad ibn al-Qasim, 17 at the head of an army. So you wonder how long do we have? 10 minutes, inshallah. Uh, obviously, I want to leave time for dua at the end. But we're just getting to the juicy part, so I'll try and hurry up a bit here. So he then made his way into sin. And he crossed the Indus Valley River. And he begins his attack. And along the way, fortress after fortress capitulates to him. And enemies are retreating at the same time. And simultaneously, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, shadowing Muhammad ibn Qasir's forces on the land, at sea, he sent five what's called Minjani. Minjani in Arabic is a mangano. It's a huge, massive catapult. Because cities back then were fortified, huge walls around it. To break into the city, to penetrate into the city, you needed to breach the walls. And how do you do that? You can't throw arrows or rocks or sticks. You need a huge catapult. So these catapults were shadowing them and then they were disembarked on land at an undisclosed location. So he is being given everything. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf is providing him with all the money, all the resources, all the supplies he wants to conquer the land and return these Muslims back to safety. And this is when Muhammad ibn Qasim, what I want to point out here is how courageous he was first and foremost and number two how humane and merciful he was one fortress capitulated and surrendered he actually went out of his way he went out of his way to treat the injured opposition soldiers he brought them into his camp treated them waited till they'd recovered to a full term and then let them go free the enemy commander he said doesn't behove doesn't behove an honorable chivalrous soldier to disrespect another soldier so I release you I let you go free as well so he carried on making his way until he reached the biggest test of his campaign which was a, his, a city historically known as Debal does anybody know what that corresponds to today? Karachi mashallah. Karachi modern day Karachi so he made his way to Karachi heavily fortified the people had already filled up Lots of satchels of water and they'd already then stocked with all of their sustenance and provision so they were ready, they were ready for a siege. Muhammad ibn Qasim was also ready but the problem was the land outside, it wasn't the perfect season for fertile land. So he had to rely on minimal provisions. So he started the siege. Now most people in Sindh at that time were Buddhists or they followed their local polytheistic pagan tradition. Now the thing is, as the Muslims moved and marched from one city to another, you'll be surprised, Buddhists actually came out of their dwellings and welcomed the Muslims with open arms, with singing and dancing and cheering. Why do you think that was? Because they knew Muslims have arrived. Muslims are liberators. Why is that? They have the Qur'an with them. The Qur'an has its own unique brand of justice. Buddhists had uh, sort of what's called an egalitarian outlook. They had a very fair and equitable social structure. They didn't have the caste system like the people of India had. So people of India back then actually used to move to Sindh. Why? So that they could convert to Buddhism and that they, could, they just wanted to be treated equally. But in India, the caste system was very rigid. It was your position in society was judged based on the lottery of life. If you're born into a poor family, well, brace yourself for a life of misery. If you're born into the Brahmin stratum at the top, then you can expect luxury and entertainment. But you couldn't move out of that social class. So it's very debilitating and demoralizing. Imagine somebody telling you, you know what, for the rest of your life, you're going to be, uh, you're going to work for the council as uh, a dustbin man. You can't do anything. No matter how clever, intellectual and talented you are, that's going to be your life. So people moved to Sindh. They converted to Buddhism. Now, when Islam came, when Islam came, people thought, you know what? Islam is as equitable and even more fair than Buddhism. Islam can offer us more than Buddhism can. Because the Quran came with its own brand of justice. And these people were enthralled with that idea of justice. So Muhammad ibn Qasim carried on. People accepted Islam in droves. He came to the fort of Debal. At the top of Debal, there was a monastery. And that monastery had a red flag at the top. 
The people of Nepal, the inhabitants knew, as long as this standard and flag remains intact, our troops still have the, ha the upper ground, our troops still have an edge over the Muslims, and we can still prevail, we can still win. So Muhammad ibn Qasim told his operators of these mangadils, he told them, aim for that flag at the top. And within moments he was taken down. The people of Debar, they were thrust into a frenzy. Complete chaos. They had no idea if their troops had surrendered or if they'd lost or if the walls had been breached. So they made their way out of the, uh, the fortress as a sortie, as an outward attack. And they met the swords of the Muslims and they were defeated. Just to quickly speed up here. So he conquered everything. He captured Sindh and he made his way back to Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Uh, by, by letter. He sent letters back to him. Hajjaj said, make sure, make sure you treat the people with respect. You treat them humanely. You treat them with mercy and clemency. Why? Because people are the foundation of a society, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. You need people and traders and workmen and a workforce to thrive. You need a thriving, prosperous economy. So make sure you treat all Muslims and non-Muslims with equity and fairness. And even Buddhist temples and monasteries which have been destroyed in the fighting, Hajjaj said, you know what, let them rebuild it. Let them rebuild it to how it was before. So he gave them a sort of freedom of religion. Now people say, that's what I'm saying, Muhammad ibn al-Qasim, people say he was a tyrant and he was a murderer, he was out for blood. And Muhammad ibn al-Qasim was somebody who was a bigot and he hated non-Muslims. Right? But I've just proved to you here that Muhammad ibn al-Qasim was somebody who looked out for everyone and anyone. Why are we talking about this? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, if you hear about a Muslim brother being slandered in your presence, make sure you defend his honor. Why? Because on the Day of Judgment, Allah will defend your honor. We hope now that on the Day of Judgment, because we've upheld the honor of Muhammad ibn Qasim, who brought Islam, he opened, paved the way for Islam to enter into India, we hope Allah will honor us on the Day of Judgment. To quickly finish off, there was a regime change. Al-Walid the Caliph died. Six months after Muhammad ibn Qasim took the last stronghold, Multan, in Sindh. And in his place, in his stead, Suleiman, his brother, came as the caliph. Suleiman had a grudge with Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. So he wanted to remove all of Hajjaj's family members and relatives from positions of power and authority. So ibn Qasim was called back, and along the way, he was taken by a general in Basra, and he was martyred and killed. May Allah bless him. But in his dying moments, Somebody said, why don't you resist Suleiman? Suleiman was trying to depose him and remove him from his position. So he said, you know what? I could, with my army of thousands of troops, march on the Caliph and say, I'm refusing to step down. You know what he said? He said, I would rather sacrifice my life for the unity of the Muslims, rather than I would sacrifice my honor and my life for the unity of the Muslims. When he made his way out of his house in Brahmanabad, which was the capital of Sindh, the entire population wept and lamented for him. And they were losing such a chivalrous and gentleman general and commander as him. When he died, the locals, non-Muslims and Muslims alike, all mourned his death. And they built a monument for him in a city called Kirij. So this is Muhammad ibn Qasim. Now the story you hear in your gush adabs, you can put a bit of flesh onto the bones there with Muhammad ibn Qasim. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost, he gives us true understanding of our history and our heritage and he also gives us the true value and understanding of the Quran. Ameen wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.